All right. Welcome, everybody, to Artful Tuesdays. That's what I'm calling it, Tom. I don't know if you knew. That's for now what I'm calling it until someone comes up with a better name. As long as you don't change it every week. Well, so far, I haven't. So far, it's been Artful Tuesdays for like three weeks. I think this will be week three, um, depending on when this goes out. So this is a pre-recorded one that we do uh, rather than a live one. And yeah, so if anybody has a better name than Artful Tuesdays, but we are putting something out on the at 4 p.m. Central Time or 5 p.m. Eastern Time every Tuesday. That's the goal. Um, and this is part of Rozzy's master plan to have scheduled content. And eventually, I think we should have like a, you know, you can almost get like a TV guide for stuff. And you could say, oh, yeah, this is happening here, here. And you can get like a month in advance and, you know, plan out. And this is going to be live. This is recorded. That's going to take time. That's going to take money. So give lots of money to ARC. UK to help make that happen. So um, today we're going to talk about a controversial poem that happens to be one of my favorite poems of all time, which, um, and it goes in and out where I'll, there's some, there's some words worth poem that'll be my favorite, but this one tends to always affect me and it's just meant a lot and it's a really good poem and it's very interesting. Um, it's a little more difficult than what we've done in the past. What I've done on this show uh, in the past so far. If you if you follow me at Troubadour Magazine, it's not the most difficult uh, poem that I've done there for sure, but it's definitely up there. Um, so Tom, by the way, I, I didn't introduce you this time. You're now a regular guest, so uh, hopefully right. people know you, Tom Novak. I'm the engineer who's interested in talking about art. The engineer who's interested in talking about art. So a good model for everybody else who doesn't like art and they use the excuse of I'm not an art person. I'm an engineer. I didn't use logical to per Yeah. Neither no. did I. Um, I. I wasn't a logical person either though. So <laughs> I don't know what I was, but yeah. So I, I think it's great. I think you need, everyone needs art in their life. It's not an optional thing. Um, it's, it's, you know, not, it's not something that a, a good life is worth living without it. I should, that's not a very good way of putting it, but you know, I, I think no, I totally agree, Kirk. I think that's actually a great way of putting it. Yeah. So, like, without art, life is pretty meaningless. I, I would, I think. Yeah. Uh, I, well, I agree with that. Yeah. So, we're going to talk about some powerful art. Um, this one's going to be, like I said, I think it's going to be a challenge for some of you the first time. It's a poem I've read probably hundreds and hundreds of times at this point. Uh, just once in a while, I'll just read through it. Um, I, well, I won't, I won't go into the effect that it has on me. We'll see what happens. I might be able to hold it in, but it has always had a very strong effect on me reading it. There's a couple of terms I want to tell you ahead of time because it's told um, by a, it, it's, I'll give you some of the perspective and we'll go through the poem, but I want to set it up so it's not completely foreign and random to you when you first hear it. Um, so the, the narration is a British soldier uh, a veteran talking to other soldiers at a bar, basically. And he, it's very, I can't remember, I, I knew this years ago, I should have looked it up before the show, but I, I forgot I was going to talk about it like this, but there's a certain slang, a heavy slang that he has that I think might be like um, Irish or something like that. Uh, some, some kind of slang that he's using that's like late 1890s Irish, you know, common, commoner slang. Uh, especially among veterans. And he, he'll he say talk, things like um, Alder shot it and penny fights. And you don't have to know exactly the definition of it, everything, right? Like, and sometimes it's just like exclamations. Like he'll say penny lao and hither ow and things like that. And those are kind of just exclamations of like, get over here or do that, like things like that. And that's what you need to know. The biggest term that I think you really need to know to understand all of this is regimental beastie, B H I. S-T-I, beastie. And a beastie it was a water carrier. And that's what the veterans called in the Indian water carrier. So the, the native Indian, this is when Britain was, you know, had an empire and they were in Britain in, the, in India, they would have local Indi, you know, Indian tribe men carry their water for the, the troops during the, the wars in India. Okay, so that's the setup. A veteran is at a bar talking to young soldiers and you know, kind of saying, you know, it starts off with a kind of, um, you think you know about stuff and you don't know nothing, right? That kind of, that kind of old man uh, 
Tom, you'll know this re- reference, Nestor to the younger, to the younger kids. Of course, I see. Okay, so I'm going to pop this on the screen and we'll read my favorite poem, Gunga Din by Rudyard Kipling. Gunga Din. Now, have you ever heard of this poem, Tom? Any chance? Um, I don't think so. I, I know quite a lot of Rudyard Kipling, uh, but I haven't heard of this. Okay, good. I'm glad I get to introduce it to you. Um, I will try not to slip into any kind of accent because I can't, but the way it's written, sometimes it's hard not to. And I, I've tried to train my, because I'm bad at accents, but it, this, the, the language itself and the, the uh, wording and the spelling kind of makes you do it a little bit. All right, well, we here we go. Have, we should have had a guest host on who is Irish. No, uh, <laughs> maybe we could do that another reading, but you don't, I don't want you to think that you have to be able to say it in the accent in order to understand a poem. Um, all right, so let me do my best with Gunga Din. You may talk of gin and beer when you're quartered safe out here and you're sent to Benish fights and Aldershot it. But when it comes to slaughter, you will do your work on water and you'll lick the bloomin' boots of him that's got it. Now in India's sunny clime, where I used to spend my time, a servant of Her Majesty the Queen, of all them black-faced crew, the finest man I knew was our regimental beastie Gunga Din. He was Din, 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 you limp and lump of brick dust Gunga Din. Hi, Slippy, hither out. Water, get it, Benny Lau, you squidgy-nosed old idol Gunga Din. The uniform he wore was nothing much before and rather less than art for that behind, for a piece of twisty rag and a goatskin water bag was all the field equipment he could find. When the sweatin' troop train lay in a sidin through the day, where the eat would make your bloomin' eyebrows crawl, we shouted, Hetty by, till our throats were bricky dry. Then we whopped him, cause he couldn't serve us all. It was din, 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 you even. Where the mischief have you been? You put some jewelry in it, or I'll marrow you this minute if you don't fill up my helmet, Gunga Din. He would dot and carry one till the longest day was done, and he didn't seem to know the use of fear. If we charged or broke or cut, you could bet your bloomin' nut he'd be waiting fifty paces right flank rear. With his musk on his back, he would skip with our attack and watch us till the bugles made retire. And for all his dirty eyed, he was white, pure, clear white inside, when he went to tend the wounded under fire. It was Din, 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 with the bullets kicking dust spots on the green. When the cartridges ran out, you could hear the front rank shout, Hi, ammunition mules and Gunga Din. I shan't forget the night when I dropped behind the fight with a bullet where my belt plate should have been. I was choking mad with thirst, and the man that spied me first was our good old grinning, grunting Gunga Din. He lifted up me head, and he plugged me where I bled, and he gave me arf a pint of water green. It was crawling and it stunk, but of all the drinks, drinks I've drunk, I'm gratefulest to one from Gunga Din. It was Din, Din, Din. Here's a beggar with a bullet through his spleen. He's chewing up the ground. He's kicking all around. For God's sake, get the water, Gunga Din. He carried me away to where a dooley lay, and a bullet come and drilled the beggar clean. He put me safe inside, and just before he died, I hope you liked your drink, says Gunga Din. So I'll meet, you, I'll meet him later on, at the place where he is gone, where it's always double drill and no canteen. You'll be squatting on the coals, giving drink to poor damn souls, and I'll get a swig in hell from Gunga Den. Yes, Den, 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 you Lazarusian leather Gunga Den, though I've belted you and flayed you by the living God that made you, you're a better man than I am, Gunga Den. Finale. Thank you. 
All right. What are your first thoughts? What is the first thing you, because it's your first reading. So it's, I know it's very difficult, but just what comes to mind for you? I'm getting a, a sense of respect um, for this Gunga Din character from the speaker. You said he was a captain? Just a veteran. Doesn't say what he is. You, know, um, okay. you may talk so, a jit and beer when you're quartered safe out here. You know, it's just a vet at a, at a guy saying, yeah, you guys are talking smack, like how <laughs> tough you are, you kids. But you have no idea what it's like, you know, when you're, um, you're, you're, you today are sent to penny fights and, you know, like cheap fights, right? And I'll just shot it. But when it comes to slaughter, you'll do your work on water and you'll lick the blooming boots of him that's got it, right? This is coming from a man of experience talking to young, young soldiers who are blustering and, you know. And he's, he's reminiscing about his time in, in India, which I guess is just a, an Irish word, an Irish way of saying India. Now in India's sunny climb, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's Irish, it's a slang. Okay, it's a slang. Um, I, I, I think he's Irish or some, mm -hmm. something, so, like, something on the British Isles. Yeah, I mean, I think he's reminiscing about someone who he had a lot of respect for um, in a very particular relationship though. It wasn't just a comrade, uh, someone who was fighting with him it was someone who was basically the help on the battlefield, right? Who, who ran the water and the supplies um, during the battle. Um, but I, I think he's recognizing the, the skill and bravery of that, uh, of that person, um, despite the role, which is not as, um, uh, it, it doesn't have, it's not as honorable seeming as just a regular soldier. Now, do you think it's just the role that he's attacking at the beginning? Like, what do um, they, think about what they call him, right? Uh, you limp and lump of brick dust gunged in, water, get it, you squidgy nosed old idol. Like, think about the, the names they call him. It's yeah, not I mean, just that he's a water carrier. No, it's it's definitely you know he's he's also in that role I think because of his um, his background like he's not um, he's not one of the fighters he's a he's probably some kind of um, help from a local tribe or um, you know another um, group of people and. He'd probably put in that position just because of some kind of racial divide or some kind of not necessarily class, but uh, in a way, just like a, a nationality divide um, where, you know, this army, whatever he, army he's in, has put this person he's in the British military. Okay. So, yeah, the he was British a servant military. of Her Majesty the Queen. Right. And this is during the imperial time. Yeah, so Britain, it's one so of the it's one of the groups. Um, he's fighting that, the tribes in India. Yeah, and some some of the tribes fought for the the, uh, the queen, right? And some didn't, right? Some they and there are probably other forces. I don't know the whole history. I don't think you yeah. need to. Um, you just need to understand that he's a veteran of this war. I mean, think about like Afghanistan is a good yeah. parallel, right? Where it's like you're a British soldier, you're fighting you know, the Taliban, but you also have Afghanistan interpreters, for instance, who are, who were just recently abandoned um, to the chagrin yeah. of many people, rightfully the chagrin of many, many people, especially veterans. And I, but I think the difference though is that in modern day times, those um, Afghani allies would still, they, you know, they'd have a position of equal respect to the, the soldiers um, Maybe. I mean, I don't know. I wasn't I mean, there. I think it's expected that's, at least. Right. I, I mean, yeah. I don't know. I, it's that's a, you'd have to talk to veterans about that. One. Okay. Like, especially yeah. when they were young, because, so let's go through the poem a little bit. So I think you're, you're touching on the really, really important issues. Right. Um, but there's a trend, there's a lesson learned. It's not just, he's randomly telling these guys something, some, you know, story he's, talking about something he learned 
like a, a very pivotal experience he had. Well, I'm getting the sense that he learned to, you know, respect this man's character despite these preconceived notions that he's somehow inferior because of belonging to, you know, a tribe that's under the rule of the British crown. Yeah, so I, this is, you know, it's called a racist poem often. And part of it is because, what's that? I mean, it definitely has some racism, but it's it's actually more countering the racism. Well, it's very countering the racism, yeah. yeah. And that's what people point out who defend it, but it has been attacked over the years, especially recently. In fact, famously, in just a, like a, a couple of years ago, I think, or maybe two years ago, a Cambridge uh, prep school uh, in England changed its name from Gungadin Hall or something like that to Dragon Hall or something like that because they didn't like, because Gunga uh, in particular had become a racial slur. Uh, and it, I think it, it might be a racial slur, although it doesn't seem to be very popular. But again, they missed the whole point of the poem if, yeah. if, they're, if they take it that way. So yeah, so you have this, this veteran who's telling the story about this, the, of all them black faced crew, right? This is where people think it's, it's racist is of all the finest man I knew was the, this regimental beastie. And he talks about all the racial slurs they would say to him, they would abuse Gunga Den, right? They called him a lump, limp and lump of brick dust. They called him squidgy nosed old idol. And then they treated him poorly, right? The uniform he wore was nothing much before and rather less than art for that, which means half of that behind yeah. Um, for a piece of twisty rag and a goatskin water bag. So compared to them, you know, visually, and again, you could think about Afghanistan as you have like, a, you know, let's take an, an American military soldier with like, you know, $500,000 worth of equipment around him. And then you have some guy in like, you know, uh, a rags type, basically, or like a t-shirt and jeans that he got third hand that was delivered to him or something like that. And they're, and they're kind of next to each other. And there's, and, and the, the veteran, or the soldier at the time was saying that they were ridiculing this Gunga Din for all the stuff he didn't have, right? He was this, this um, ignorant tri tribal character who didn't have their, their learning. He didn't have their, their civilization. They're coming. So that's the other thing is like this, this idea of imperialism where the, the, you know, uh, the British were bringing, and the assumption was the, from his perspective, British was bringing like civilization, right. Um, or the, to these, you know, uncivilized people and they're fighting for their civilization. They're fighting for their lives in a sense. Um, you know, and he would, and then he talks about um, you even where the mischief have you been, you know, so they call him a heathen, right? They, they're, they, and then they threaten to marrow, to whip him to the, to the bone. If you don't fill up my helmet, right? I don't think it's just a joke in here. I don't think it's, it's the way they treated him is what the veteran is talking about, is that they treated this guy like crap, right? Like a yeah, slave. I think, it's a, I think it's important that he he mentions all these things yeah. so that the, the actual point of the poem really um, is, is really telegraphed to the audience, right? Uh, yeah. Because in your, by, by the end, you see that, you know, this, this Gunga Din character is, you know, he's very reliable, um, he, it says he was white, clear white inside. Well, that's um, a, yeah. Now I, I don't know if that's exactly referring, making a racial reference or it means white as in, as opposed to like, like white as in clean or white as opposed to black in the sense of good versus bad. Right. Um, well, I guess that could be, well, that is today, and especially in postmodernists that's been questioned. And post, like post, quote unquote, post racialists attack the idea of white being associated with clean cleanliness as racist, right? Mm. So white, you know, is a white white being associated with with uh, cleanliness with morality is evil. Yeah, it, it is he, what they say is evil. Right? And and to give another example, there's um there's the Although I'm not hat, I'm not convinced of that one by the way. There's the black hat and white hat hackers. Uh, those terms used to be used to refer to oh, yeah. bad hackers versus good hackers. Like white hat would would do work to help people from prevent them from being hacked. Um, yeah. But those terms are actually like no longer officially used because of this 
yeah. this white and black. Um, this is woke. Stigma. It's woke. Yeah, it's, this, it's woke to to know that yeah. white is not that. I mean, know. but I think I think these people are really guilty of just absolving context of anything that they of any of these terms. Like nobody is making this a racial statement unless you interpret it that way. Like it's it's really up to you, the reader, to 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 um, like if if you think that that's racist, you're making it much worse than it is i think well but what they, their argument which is at least worthy of consideration is that examples like this where you have a white guy who's talking to a black-faced crew a black man right an indian and he's saying well you're white inside right mm-hmm. like and the implication is that the goodness in him is the white thing like him the soldier who is also white you know white european yeah. And so there's been the connection in literature and there has been this connection in literature between whiteness and then the white skinned European who comes over and gives the right, you know, morality, which unfortunately has often been Christianity. And that's the other part of it, is it? Yeah. Now, I I don't necessarily, I I do think that that's true and that's that, that literary um, association has existed. I guess my view is just that there's a uh, there's something to you know there there is something to the idea on a fundamental level of white and black as in uh, you know so be, as in goodness and that has separation from skin color and uh, now I don't I, I know some people have argued the opposite of this I think there was some tri- like some people would talk about African tribes who had the reverse perspective I don't know how I mean I. I something I want to learn a little bit more about how common that is, because it seems to me on an ancient level, the more accurate thing has to do with light and darkness, right? Yeah, and the light, and night. you have good things happening in the darkness is when bad things happen. You go into the dark cave and that's where the association really lies, not skin color. Um, but people I, make it. I agree about. with you, Kirk, that, I mean, in this particular case, it's, it's a tough, uh, it's a tough case to draw a distinction because it's possible that it could be being associated with race. But he calls his hide dirty. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's that's why it's so, but I mean, but that's the point of the story is the veteran, whoever he is, is a racist at the beginning. Yeah. And that's what I think um, why I love this story so much is that, you know, people often think that, eradicating racism means yelling at people who don't use the right politically correct term, right? That it's some kind of external action where the, this is something we learn in school, unfortunately, is that if I, you know, as the woke person shout at enough people and and express my feelings about how, you know, um, anti-woke these other people are, they're not woke enough, then I will have brought about more, um, you know, anti-racist sentiments into the world, but how anti-racism really occurs and how reason and rationality really occurs is as an internal process. It's something that, you know, through observations, you come through step by step from the origin that you started with this guy in the, you know, who is 1890 or whatever, you know, he was born in like the 1840s or 50s or whatever he was. I don't know. Was, you know, he's, he seems like an older guy. He was born race. Or he's, he was raised racist, or raised to think that the white European was better. And and this, he. How do you get out of that conclusion? Does someone yelling at you? Oh, you racist piece of poop. You whatever. Like that's how you eradicate racism. No, that this poem indicates an internal process that I think is beautiful in just a few stanzas. Yeah, and I mean, I think the fundamental problem that racists have is is they're they're um they're evading um reality right by um they're choosing deliberately to to not look at um the reality of the situation and assess people by you know their character and choices and instead Mm -hmm. you know they seek this alternative um and I, i i'm not saying like, I don't think it's, it's like a, a, sim, a simple 
Uh, I don't think they do it because it's easier. I think they do it because they have um, they have problems with their own um, self esteem, their own uh, view of themselves that they have to have this world view um, so that they can in a sense, feel better about themselves without actually fixing any of their, their own issues without being honest. Right. So, mm -hmm. but I think the, the writer in this POA is doing the opposite. I think he's being, um, incredibly honest, you know, he's, uh, first there's the, uh, yeah, there's the paragraph where there's all the insults. Right. And then as you're going through stanza, uh, yeah, as you're going through the stanzas, um, he has more and more, um, think good things to say about this guy. Uh, he recognizes Gunga Din's character. Um, and, you know, by the end of it, he says, you know, he's better than, yeah, you're a better man than I am. Right. That's a very so, famous line. People quote that all the time, especially in England. It's something mm -hmm. that a lot of English boys are taught that this, this stands, this whole poem. And so that line, you're a better man than I am Gunga Din specifically has a lot of meaning um, to many English, at least in the past. Now it's unfortunately not taught as much anymore. I, th I take it. Um, so, yeah, I think you're, 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 yeah, definitely hitting on the right tune. And, you know, he's, he's coming to these realizations, right? He was making fun of them and you could notice through the din, din, din. I, I, I try not to, I'm not a good actor, but I try to like change up how I say it. I don't know if you noticed or if I was very good but I try to change up how you say it. Like at first I said it a little bit more, um, you know, like, Ew, you disgusting pig, gross thing. And then angrily in the second one. And then the third one, it's more like desperation. And then the fourth one, it's, it's real desperation or it's like dying man saying it. And then the last one is like a rejoice rejoicing. Like, yay, I get to see my friend Gunga Den, right? That's, that's how I interpret it for myself to read it differently. And I think that for me helps with the understanding of it. Um, and then if we look at each of these four stanzas, right? So we have the first stanza where we have the veteran, and this is really important of, of reading poetry and thinking about like what, you know, why did this artist choose this? I mean, he's putting, he's packing in a lot with four stanzas, four short, relatively four short stanzas Kipling is packing in a lot of stuff, which is the beauty of poetry in particular, right? Like you could have a whole novel that expresses the theme that he's getting to you in, in one punch of four quick stanzas. And he starts off by this setting up the deepest values that these soldiers at this bar have. And what is the deep value um, that he's, indicating in these first couple of lines. It's underlying, this is subtext, right? What can you think of it? You may talk of gin and you may talk about gin and beer when you're quartered safe out ear when and you're sent to penny fights and elders shot it. What what's the underlying, you know, but when it comes to slaughter, you'll do your work on water and you'll what's the underlying value, do you think? Of a soldier like this who's talking about safety versus experience in battle, courage, right? So it's easy to uh, talk about, you know, how difficult things are um, when you're quartered safe out here and you're sent to penny fight. Again, cheap, easy fights is what I, is what I translated that to. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's directly affronting these younger soldiers by, by saying, you know, you guys have it, <laughs> you, you younger generation have it easy, you know? Um, look where I'm coming from, you know, the people I fought with. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, think of it like, um, you know, you've read the Iliad with me. Think of it when, um, what is it, Diomedes taunts Paris because he has a bow, an arrow, right? Like if you, and, he, and I think it's Diomedes, and Diomedes gets hit in the, in the foot and he, he anchor, Paris anchors, anchors him to the ground. He's like, if you were man enough to actually face me in, in real battle face to face, you would, right? Like you're out there safe away from me. And so there's an association in this poem in terms of value right at the beginning of being right in the midst of the fight as, you know, being in the center of the brutality of the fight as a deep value of warriors, right? And so you have this old warrior, and again, to bring it into modern terms, you could say like 
you know, a World War II vet talking about a drone strike, you know, a uh, person. And you don't know what it's like to be, you know, you're a drone strike attack, you know, fighter. I actually fought in a plane where I was, you know, being shot out from ground and air and, you know, all my friends were dead, you know, blah, 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 right? So that kind of interchange where the value is the more you, in the fight you are, the more in the brutality of it. Mm-hmm. So that's how this first, you know, part this first stanza starts off and, and he then he talks about Gunga Din and how they treated him right um and and he by the way it's not an, an accident that he calls him the finest man i knew in in relation to what this value we just talked about mm-hmm. and we're going to learn that later right so um but we get a lot of descriptions of him so they treated him bad but he was you know he had nothing he wore nothing he just carried the equipment that's it and just kind of smiling you know, good old blooming smile guy walking around. It was as hot as can be, you know, where the eat would make your blooming eyebrows crawl. I love that imagery, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's just like, you're, it feels like, you know, like a cartoon that if they were trying to express how hot it was and they would have it red outside and, and then they might even have your eyebrows kind of moving around or something because it's like you're, you're sweating so much. And, yeah. Um, and then people still treating him bad and because they're all desperate for, for water. And yet he would just dot and carry one. And even in the longest day, of course, the longest day always refers to a day of fighting. Um, you know, the more fighting there is, the more, the longer the day seems. Um, and, you know, you could bet your, you know, if we charged or broke or cut, so that's how the, 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 the battle is going. We charging or we broke away and retreated or we, we cut away or whatever it is, you could bet your bloom and nut, he'd be waiting 50 paces right flank rear with his musk on his back he would skip with our attack and watch us till the bugles made retire. So in other words, he's in the midst of the battle. Right. Um, and for all his dirty eyed, uh, when he went to wound the, tend the wounded under fire. So he's like that guy, if you're, you've seen war movies where you have like the, the, the medic or even the priest like out there while everyone's getting shot at. And it's like, wow, geez. <laughs> like, if you, like hacksaw Ridge is like that, where the guy's going up. I yeah. And saving movie. private Ryan. Well, it's in Saving Private Ryan, but Hacksaw Ridge, I don't know if, did you see that? I mean, I haven't, but I I understand the premise. It's, you know, it's really focused on the one character who refuses to wear. Yeah, Yeah. he won't carry weapons, right? Yep, yep. he won't carry weapons. It's against his religion. So, um, and then the question is about his bravery. And then he proves, you know, like, is he really in the fight? And and they gain, he gains their respect by being more courageous than the rest of them, in a sense. He just won't kill. Um, so now that's a whole, you know, that's a whole nother story though. There's, there's a different implication of not being willing to kill or fight, you know, but, but if you're focusing on bravery as in under fire, Gunga Dan starts to look pretty heroic, right? As if that's the top value, which in this poem it's set up as, then he starts doing it, right? And then he talks about this, this stanza, the next stanza where he, he remembers a night when what happened to him? Do you remember? Well, I mean, a bullet got him. Yep. And he got hit. Yeah. And so, you know, he needs nourishment. He's, he's been hit. He's, uh, um, I guess, like water. It's just, it's just water, right? I, am I, or am I, am I wrong to say that? Okay. Yeah, but yeah, it's so. remember he um at the beginning, um, somewhere I don't remember exactly the line. There's somewhere where he talks about you won't care what the water's like. Yeah, right. So this is uh, it was crawling and it stunk, but of all the drinks I've drunk, I'm grateful. So it's a gross, disgusting, infested thing of water. But he's sitting there dying in the heat, and he doesn't care. It's like you know heavenly mana to him, mm-hmm. and and that's the association with Gunga Dent. I'm grateful is for one of from Gunga Den, who again, there's bullets going all around and he's coming out there to this wounded guy, the narrator, and giving him this dirty water. Right. But it's irrelevant that it's dirty at this point. Yeah. And then the, you know, and then he he the din din din, you know, he's he's like begging him about, you know, oh, here's this this poor beggar. Right now he's a beggar. Um you know, with a bullet through his spleen and, and he's, you can, the imagery of he's chewing up the ground and he's kicking all around 
I the like that the water. I like what the poet does with Din Din Din. Um, yeah, you you definitely get the sense even without uh, you reading it differently each time, but you get the sense that it's used a different way each yeah. time. Yeah. Um, I think that emphasizes the changing of um, the relationship between the soldier and Gunga Din. Absolutely. And the context informs the way that you, that I, you know, read it right. generally. Yeah. Um, now, just as a general rule of thumb, one mistake I think people make, and I make this mistake all the time, is to read a poem too affectedly, right? Like too over the top. Like so, and really, because it's supposed to be about the words and the sounds of the words. So when you add too much stank on it <laughs> or add too much, like, um, here's a beggar with a, bullet through his spleen he's chewing up the like you do too much of that it's like whoa dude calm down like there's an art to yeah. the level that you're supposed to do and i this poem usually i'm better at it this poem is the hardest one for me because of the slang and the spelling and then you know because of the the din 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 that there's actually the um a parallel there with um with dance that's dance that's done to music i, I think a lot of dancers um who i think don't have very good choreography they will try to basically pantomime the song so yeah. you know if if the song says took you took my heart away to like you know put the oh. hand on their heart and <laughs> yeah, like yeah. take it out or something right the britney so, spears move it's this over dramatization and it and actually takes away from the medium yeah. that's trying to be emphasized which is the music in that case right yeah. Yeah. um i think that's a it. better choreographed dance will focus on the emotions that are brought about through the music, but not by miming the actual words in the song, right? Yeah. And, and I think poetry said out loud like this is, is the same way. I mean, the, the, to the extent that you're acting it out, um, it's just to emphasize the poem, right? Um, it's, not, it's not to actually act out the, the, what's being said or done in the, in the poem. Yeah, I mean, the way that I think it's Elizabeth Drew or some some teacher, a writer of, on, on poetry says you shouldn't read poetry affectedly, but affectionately, mm. right? So like it is affectionate. And so it's not that you don't have any emphasis. You, you automatically have some, but, um, you know, there, there's a whole debate about how much. And again, it's really a personal choice. I like I was just pointing out. Um, I've heard this before, like I, I, I hate to say, it, but at a previous Ocon, like I've heard there's quite a few poetry readings and the ones that were not very good were the ones where they were very affection, affected. And I was like, dude, that's too much. Like you gotta, you gotta calm it down. Um, you know, I, I, I respect people who just go up on stage to do that. Good for them. But you know, you're losing too much of the meaning of the word when you do that. So anyway, well, I, think, I think Lisa Van Dam reads poetry really well. Oh yeah. She's great. Well, I mean, <laughs> she does it professionally. So I hope yeah. so. Uh, she's wonderful at it yeah and i think i, I think if, you want, if, if you're in the audience and you want to hear good poetry reading then find one of lisa van dam's recordings or listen yeah. to kirk again because he's also well, great <laughs> yeah well she's the one who introduced me to elizabeth drew and that concept of effectively not affectionately so she's the one who actually taught me that so yeah mm -hmm. I, I think that's you know i, I totally agree there's a read with me app make sure you go check that out uh, she doesn't have too many poems on there yet, but I hope she will have some po more poems. Okay, so going on to the next one, um, the next stanza. So, you know, he's gotten shot, the narrator, and then he's telling, he's, again, still telling the story to these vets, right, to these uh, soldiers that he's at the bar with. And he carried me away to where a dually lay. That's like a, um, what's it called? Like we carry a guy on, 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 during war. Um, you put him, you lay him down, and you have two guys on one guy, two guys on each side, or one guy on each side holding it. That's it called. Ah. Anyway, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Okay. I can't remember the actual term for it. Um, and then and a bullet come and drilled the beggar clean. So now Gunga Den is the beggar and a build, you know, uh, drew him clean. I it took me hundreds of readings, hundreds, to be able to read this section without crying. Like um, he put me safe inside and I just, cause I visual, I got so into it and I could just see him just before he died. I, I always got choked up. I hope you liked your drink. That's the last words, 
right, of Gunga Dent. And it's just like, Jesus, man, that guy is such a, you know, hero. Like he's doing his job no matter what. He's fighting, you know, he's fighting alongside them. And, you know, all he cares about is making sure that these guys who are maybe heroes to him in a certain way, that they had their drink and, and he then, you know, dies, right? Mm -hmm. Ugh, that, that kills me every time. Yeah. Uh, it still killed me in this one a little bit, but I've gotten to a point in reading it so much um, that I can, I can not cry out loud. <laughs> um, so then he dies. And then the ending is this description of him, the narrator meeting Gunga Din in hell. And it's an interesting thought that they're both in hell. And the question is, why are they both in hell? And this is one thing that, you know, some of the, the, the wokists get, um, you know, th that there's something wrong here. And look, there's, there's you know, it is 1890, but, but why do you think they're both in hell? Both. Well, I mean, soldiers, it, it seems to me, I don't know if I'm getting this just from Holly or whatever, but I'll, I think a lot of soldiers throughout history, you know, they're, they kind of glorify, um, you know, they're going to, they're going to die and they're going to go to hell. That seems like a common uh, trope, at least to mm, me. That's what you're saying. Because they've killed, so they're going to hell. That's yeah, and, and and it's also like, you know, the place where the badasses end up, right? It's not I think that's more modern, by the way. I think that's like a World War One and Two and on, perhaps. Like a, It's like a post-World War One type of idea. Mm. Um, I don't think it's as common in the past where they thought they were righteous. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and it, you, like, if you look at medieval wars, they, I don't think they thought that. I think they all thought they were, you know, the equivalent of the 72 virgins type thing they were going to get in the afterlife. And that's why they were um, not, you know, there's different wars and different fighting, but this is around that time. So maybe that's part of it is that, but think about within the context of the poem, what did he do wrong morally in his view? Gunga Din is a, is no, the narrator, the narrator. He's, he's a, he's not, He's not of the faith, right? So okay, so of Gunga Den, he's a heathen. So that's why he's in hell. Why is the narrator in hell? I think the poet is expressing regret over his yes, that's um, it. His prejudice. Yes, that's it. The way he treated him. Yeah. Right. So one question to ask yourself about making this: I don't think all art can be made personal but this definitely can i mean have you ever treated somebody poorly and then later came to realize that that was actually a noble person that you were dealing with and oh, you didn't absolutely <laughs> yeah me too in high school i was kind of a jerk to some people yeah. and i think about that sometimes right and i think and that's i think another reason why this poem affects me is that you know i understand the ignorance and the stupidity um or just ignorance and then just treating people the way everybody else treated them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then later, you know, realizing how noble that person was to deal with it, to, to be, you know, to keep maintain their pride, to be a good person amidst mistreatment. Right. And um, not to say that you should just kind of quietly do it, but you know, whatever the point is that we, a lot of us have had that experience if we're honest, mm -hmm. where we've thought about somebody in one way and then through experience realize something very different about them right yeah and and i i mean the person doesn't necessarily need to be the greatest either it's just a, mag a matter of prejudice in this in this poem the, the person who he misjudged is like he does admit like he's really great at the end but you know you get that same you can have that same experience of of improperly treating someone um yeah. uh they might not even be the best but you like still if they if they if you treated them the way they didn't deserve then that's that's something to think about and i think i think this poem uh it, it did make it did make me think about times when like i had sort of a prejudice not racism it, it specifically but definitely a prejudice where you know based on someone's um uh, perhaps their belief or their initial attitude, initial impressions, you know, mm. you, I, I treat them in a way they didn't deserve. And then, you know, over time you realize, wait, you know, maybe I should, I should realize this person's virtues as well. Right. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think all of us, if we're honest, and I'm not talking about racism. I'm just talking about, yes, what you're saying, that realization. And that's what I think this poem is about. Gunga Din is about the realization of something deeper and universal in this person who looks and acts and be, behaves very differently than you do. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's, you know, to me, this is like the ultimate anti-racist poem, which is why it's such an interesting thing um, that some, you know, that some people have taken this to be a very ultimate racist poem, because it's really about a man who discovers the universal moral value in a person who we did not know it could possibly exist in. Well, I mean, if I were to throw a, an idea out there, I would say that the, the woke people who who cry against this stuff, I don't think they recognize the idea of universal human values. And I don't think mm. they are, um, I don't think they're pushing back back against racism for good intentions. I think yeah, that that's a good they idea. have a bad underlying understanding of what racism is. And so they're, they're acting on their, like their understanding of it, but it, it's, it's a wrong framework, I think. I really no, that's think a good way of putting it. Yeah. don't respect the individual's mind and the ability to make choices. And uh, like, I don't think they believe in free will. That's, <laughs> I think that's the underlying premise, even though they, I mean, I don't think a lot of them are smart enough to realize that. Well, I, I personally wouldn't put it in terms of smart, or not smart right. necessarily. Right. I think there's something else going on, but I would agree. I mean, I agree with you. And I would just say like, if I were a teacher at a university in the humanities, I would require this of all students to read and for us to discuss. I think it's a, you know, I think it should be done in high school, um, but, you know, college is fine too, of course, or any period. But I think like it's a great one to discuss to get these ideas out uh, into the open so people can address them. And, you know, if people automatically interpret it as racist, I would, you know, start asking them questions, get them to dig into it, ask them who's the narrator, you know, things like that. And that's why I think it's such a powerful, amazing poem that has always been, I mean, it is a staple in English, um, you know, in England of their, um, you know, of their training of, of young boys and girls, uh, of all kids would read. I think all Americans should read. I think this is a poem that every human should read at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, it's one of those poems. And it is, you know, I talked about fine art and art with Sandra Shaw recently. Um, yeah, it was a great artist. video. I, I'm uh, still thank you. halfway through watching it. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, it's... And, we, you know, we talked about fine art as being fine because it's more universal. It appeals to more people, right, versus something that's more specific to the time. And this is universal. I think this ap- appeals, even though it's about a specific war, although notice how there's not a lot of detail about the war, right? It's really about a veteran who's talking to other soldiers, but it's really about a man who is coming to a realization about another man who he had misjudged, right? That's, you could dig deeper and it's all there in a very strong, solid uh, poem. And that's why it's, you know, I think it's a wonderful poem. It has multiple layers and it's, you know, again, it's to me, the slang really adds. So the slang makes it a little bit more temporal, right? So it makes it more specific in time. This is slang that even, you know, um, the, the colloquialisms of uh, I- Ireland or Scotland or wherever this, like, I'm sorry for whoever, uh, th- that that colloquialisms are probably not really used as much anymore. And that's. But the- Kirk, I'm, I'm, I just want to address, cause I, I'm worried. I like, I'm worried for the engineer who, who, who's watching this and still doesn't <laughs> really realize the, the value of art. Uh-huh. Um, this, I, I don't think poetry is like just a, a means of, you know, learning lessons or being like, you know, um, uh, told about a specific virtue that you should have, right? It's, it's mm. a, you, I, I think primarily the value of this in a po in a, in the form of a poem is the, the emotional value you get from reading this, you know, this, the story of someone who's learning mm-hmm. this, this virtue, um, and it's it's told in a way that um, appeals to uh, you know it it awakens your sort of 
it awakens your values in an emotional way, right? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, like you said, you, you, you cried when you read the, the part about Gunga dying um, for a long time, right? So I don't think the, the main value of this is, is necessarily the, the, the specific lesson that's being taught, right? It's the way that that is being told and it's being concretized um, in a beautiful way, right? It's, it's, a, it's a concise little story. And, um, you know, we, we learn a lot about the poet or the character who the poet is, is sort of playing in this. Um, well, if and- I, let me build on what you're saying, because I love sure. it. So Wordsworth has a saying, um, this guy back here, my favorite, has a saying that poetry is the finer, is the breath and finer spirit of all knowledge. And what you're saying, I think, is what he's saying is that we can lay out the logical facts in a, you know, date, time, period, and and all the specific engineering type facts on a spreadsheet and make it all nice. But in order for it to really integrate into your soul, you need art to do that. And that's what this art does. So you know, if we're trying to tell you how to be a better person or, or like what it means to be courageous, right? We could just take this poem as what it means to be courageous. We can list out, you know, wars that you could fight in and we could talk about, you know, the logical, but really- Here are some facts about how to be courageous. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, here's, here's a description of it, but really the way for it to integrate into your soul is to see courage in person. And then in this case, you know, this is a poem that's more broadly about the process of, changing as a human internally, right? Be a, a discovery about another person. And there's no, so I can tell you, um, you know, that racism was bad, right? That, that people hated each other, that they're, I can give you all these facts about 1960s Southern America and all the things that happened. But for you to really realize, one, the injustice of it, and two, the difficulty of transitioning out of that, Right, like why that was such an achievement. We take it for granted that 1960s was such an achievement um, because we think that we eradicated racism. We didn't do shit, right? <laughs> we today were are born in the process in the 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 um, the track of this racist that was ended before we were born, and we are the the byproducts. The, we are the beneficiaries of this wonderful world where racism has been brought down a notch at least and and many individuals and it's, you know, already assumed and taught as acquired knowledge uh, that it's already been done, but it was a process and we take that process for granted. And this poem illustrates that process. And this is, you know, so it's, that's the, the, you know, what you're talking about for, for engineers that you can't understand any of that stuff just by history book facts just by Wikipedia facts about 1960s or about the racism of 1890s and, and getting out of that racism and how difficult yeah. that is. Yeah. And it's not, you know, it's not a poet that's about shaming you uh, if you're a racist, right? Like I think, I think a lot of movies now uh, because of a bad idea of what art really is, they use the medium as a, as a way to convey a specific message. Like you should do this. Right. Rather than saying you should do this, it's like I think good art is saying this is important, right? It's yeah. It's there's a big difference, right? Um, one is really it's not prescriptive. It's not telling yeah. you, yeah, yeah like yeah. thou shalt not be racist, yeah. right? Which is what woke people do. <laughs> They're just saying just don't be racist, and it's like again, that's not effective. But we so, we, we see that reflected in the art that's made too. That like that yeah, it's all in like your face. Right? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's so. And, and no. it turns people <laughs> off from even considering yeah. these values. And I think, yeah. I think it really. It's doing more harm than good. Yes. They're professed. Yeah. Goals. It's doing more harm than good. Yeah. It's making people more entrenched. It's making people, you know, feel like they are isolated today, you know, especially based on race. Well, if you're going to make this all about race, fine, let's make it all about race. Right. Instead right. of making it about enlightenment and becoming a better person and, and, you know, going through the process internally over and over and over again to continually become better and better as a human. Mm-hmm. And um, that process is what we should be focusing on. The internal process of reasoning is what that is. That's, in a sense, what, what this 
demonstrates is a kind of emotional reasoning where he sees him as this black, you know, heathen, and then he sees his courage, and then he sees the value of him, and then he loves him, right? And that's the process, Is but he sees him as a heathen at the beginning, and that's important that he has to, otherwise there's no transition, and, you know, it, um, so the opposite today, the, the equivalent for like the wokest today is to see the old white man as some kind of evil person for being an old white man. And what he, the wokest needs to come to is the realization that there's a whole life experience that you have to grapple with to understand where he's coming from, right? Yeah. It's um, all about power to them, right? You know, which, which character yeah. has power in the scenario? Well, that, and- that's how they identify yeah. it, yeah. Yeah. which is just the height of, um, ignorance, I think, in terms of the process. But even there, like, so what I just said is almost a kind of, you know, I need to understand the wokest and where are they coming from, right? Um, and and at least to be able to understand where they're coming from to kind of help them, um, you know, and, and to make them think the process is important to at least question where they're coming from. Because right? that's what he does, is you have to be able to question that. And he questions it in the story And we all have to question it, not make assumptions about that. Oh, yeah. There's definitely a lot of people who, like, I think are are quite good and they think they're being good by adopting this mentality because they think they're being conscientious. But without a good epistemology, a a good framework for understanding how people think, it's it's hopeless, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. All right. Any last thoughts on Gungadin? Do you like it? Uh, not racist. Stamp of approval <laughs> from Tom Noack. Um, although, I mean, written in a time where maybe some of this came into play for sure. Um, yeah, that's that's my impression. And a very moving story. I think it. I think it is uh, a good piece of art. Right. I agree. Well, thank you everybody for joining. Make sure to. Um, support ARC UK so we could do a lot of these types of shows and um, grow into the future. So thank you and go read Gunga Den.